So I have a question regarding my training focus that has been covered before, but I, re but reading re recently has made me question, how can I sustainably raise my aerobic capacity? That's a key term, right? Chad aerobic capacity is what we'll talk about here. And we'll, <laughs> we'll get into defining that and everything else. He mentions, I have a 297 FTP at 4.1 Watts per kilogram but feel like on a low volume plan, my aerobic limitations have maxed out my performance to grow my FTP and I fall back on my strengths, which are high func high fractional utilization and ability to hold sweet spot for extended periods. And we'll get into fractional utilization, other stuff too. He says, so how do I best improve my aerobic capacity? Is this via specific VO2 training blocks? Is it viable to maintain this throughout a prolonged period? If this is my biggest weakness, how long can the benefits of a dedicated training blo training block last before I need to accept that I need to do some form of periodization as a cyclist in their mid forties? Uh, thanks so much in advance from Richard. So uh, big question here, but probably the best part or place to start chat is his main question. How do I improve my aerobic capacity? So what is aerobic capacity? Cause this is a term that's I've, I've heard it used loosely many times and perhaps outside of its mm -hmm. intended context. Yeah. And then, <clears throat> real quickly before we get into all that, uh, he asks if he needs to do some form of periodization. If he's following a training plan, he's already doing that, especially if he's working through the phases. So check that box. <laughs> um, all right, Richard, what is aerobic capacity? Richard and everybody, because this word gets used a lot. Um, let me start by saying what it's not. It's not roughly 120% of FTP. It's not a particular power output that's going to drive your highest oxygen uptake. It's not... It's not a number of things. If it, if you're associating a power with it or a velocity as a runner, you're looking at PVO2 max and VVO2 max. But those are things that happen at VO2 max because VO2 max is just what it says. It's the max volume, the V of oxygen, O2 consumed. And we have to quantify that uh, per time. So it's, it's always measured in minutes. If we look at it relative to body weight, it's measured in milliliters per minute per kilogram of body weight. And if we look at it absolutely, we're looking at liters per minute. So how much oxygen per single minute? And an example would be an athlete with a 50 milliliter per minute per kilogram VO2 max. So when you see that person's, or that person's VO2 max is 50 or 60 or 35, that's what we're talking about, milliliters per minute per kilogram. So if we take a 70 kilogram rider at a 50 mil per min per kg VO2 max, that's three and a half liters of oxygen consumption. Which brings us to what is oxygen consumption? Because the consumption part is a very important part of that term. What it is not, it's not your minute ventilation. It's not your ventilatory intake. It's not how much oxygen you breathe in per minute. Rather, it's the amount of oxygen you can load, deliver, and utilize. All three of those parts are key. So when it comes to loading, we're looking at what the lungs and the blood can do. Oxygen into the lungs, impart it to the blood. Then we're looking at delivery, which is the heart pumping it out, the blood carrying it, and the vasculature carrying it to the working muscle. And then as far as utilization, that's the muscle itself, the fibers, in particular, the mitochondria. So really simply, it's the amount of oxygen in minus the amount of oxygen out. So if we assume we intake this much oxygen and we expire this much oxygen, where'd the rest of it go? VO2. It got, it got consumed somewhere. Um, the, you can measure this a couple of ways. One, and probably the most common, if you go to a lab to, to, to have any of this actually quantified is gas exchange. They hook you up to a met cart, very expensive piece of equipment, pretty unpleasant process, but it can tell you how much oxygen goes in, how much CO2 goes out. So we're getting best of both worlds. We get O2 in, we get CO2 out, and we can do a lot more with that information. But in terms of just measuring aerobic consumption or oxygen consumption, you can do that with a mask that just measures oxygen. So, which still is a reasonably expensive piece of equipment. So the point is it's not a particular power. It's not a particular effort level. It's not a particular pace. It's a rate of consumption, oxygen consumption. And admittedly, we confuse this matter just a little bit because some of our workouts are classified as VO2 max workouts, but you know, blame Andrew Coggin. We're going by his power levels and I'm not trying to pass the buck here, but certain high intensity workouts have been labeled VO2 max workouts and, and we've, we've maintained that, that uh, nomenclature. One thing really quick, Chad, sorry to interject here, but I just want to Amber, how many VO two max tests have you done? Uh, I've only done one, um, where we actually had a mask on and went through that whole process. Two, two pretty early in my career. Yeah. Th they're so uncomfortable. Like, and for those that Worst don't know, like the, the dry mouth, at least that I got was the worst part of it. 
Uh, so that usually your nose is plugged with like a, a closed, effectively a closed pin, uh, part of the mask, um, or it's separate from the mask. But your the nose is plugged there, so we're just measuring everything through the mouth. And your mouth actually has to have a tube inside of it, and you're breathing through that. And so you can't close your mouth. You, it's really tough to even salivate like that. So your mouth just gets completely dry. And man, it's an extremely uncomfortable process. And I remember at the end of it, getting this number, and it was just like, oh, Okay. Like I did all of that just for this number when really I can't do much with that number, you know, like, um, and I know that it's a tempting thing for a lot of us to want to go get like a VO2 max test. Cause it is cool to, we hear of those glory numbers, like Chris room at 84, we hear of Nordic skiers, you know, tipping into the nineties even, um, which, you know, you're using more muscle mass, you'll get a higher VO2, but I, in the end, it has not, that has not changed one bit how I train. Has that for anybody else here, has your VO2 number changed in any way how you train? No, it just disappoints me. <laughs> 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 what was I, 61 or 62 or something? And I could probably lose some weight. It's very weight dependent too, which is mm -hmm. something everyone has to be aware of. And you lose 10 pounds and it goes up a bunch. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it, no. Yeah. And just as uh, you mentioned just there recently, it can detrain very quickly too. When you train your VO2 max increases, when you take, take time off, it decreases rather rapidly as well. So it's not like it's a genetic stamp that's stuck into you. And that's just exactly what you are forever. It's, it's something it, that, that changes. It's also like, a so Chris Reichert in the P12 racing in Northern California, he's a fast racer on Mike's bikes. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's not even their fastest, but he's a very good all arounder and I got dropped in a breakaway with him, but I was kind of hanging with him. And then he, I saw his, he did a VO2 max test and he was in the low eighties, which is definitely world class. Mm -hmm. And it actually just makes me like, I shouldn't have ever read that. Right. Because not knowing, I was like, oh, I can hang with this and I can do this. And I just made some mistakes, but now I'm like, he's on two different planets. He's in a different solar system than me physiologically. Yeah. And I'm not gonna be able to do that. So it's not true what I thought. But just because, and there's actually pros, I think that in the sixties, they have mm -hmm. other things that make up for it. And, uh, so if you do have a bad number, don't worry about it. Your efficiency could be really high. Your ability to operate at lactic, uh, close to lactic threshold could be really high. Your grit could be high. Your smartness could be high. Uh, a whole bunch of other tactics. things. Yeah. Your yeah. sprint power could be really high. Your explosiveness, your repeatability. I think that's like one of Pete's big strengths is he doesn't have a very high VO2 max. I think I'm higher than his but he has really good tactics, handling, uh, explosiveness and repeatability. And in mm -hmm. a crit, that's all he like, that's just about all everything you need, right? Besides he can't do a long solo breakaway, but he doesn't care. So just don't let it, big point is don't let it uh, define you. Yeah. Thanks, exactly. Nate. Yeah. Great way to recap. And sorry, Chad, for the interjection there, but many times when we talk about VO2 max numbers, testing, anything else like that, we get follow-up questions. So, mm -hmm. uh, about like, how do I test it? And what's, you know, what does the number mean? What do I do with that? So I just wanted to head those off and hopefully help some folks beforehand. So yeah, great. Good stuff. <clears throat> real quick, if you're not watching on YouTube right now, you're missing some subtle jokes that are going on on the Zoom They can't call. see it. Um, it's, I know. It's, it's oh, only they us. It's only no, they us? can't because oh. they don't have it. Mm. Ooh, <laughs> I don't Sorry, know what guys. you guys are doing, but don't break my any... uh, Zoom name. Just our, just our names. It's the Zoom name. <laughs> Got it. Okay, yeah. Don't don't break anything. I can't see it right now because oh. of a strange thing right here. Just don't break anything. I'm just, guys. I'm just causing problems. <laughs> don't mind me. <laughs> All right, back to it, Chad. Sorry. Okay, so allow me to re reiterate most of what Nate just covered. <laughs> Because we're gonna actually cover all of that stuff. <laughs> so, first, why is VO2 max so important? Basically, to ride or race long durations, we have to have the ability to utilize oxygen. It's vitally, com vitally crucial, vital component of what we do as endurance athletes and what the fuels and, and the metabolisms we rely on. Fat metabolism, entirely aerobic. Sugar or carbohydrate metabolism, the byproducts are metabolized aerobically creatine phosphate, st phosphate stores, so your PCR stores that are in the muscle that allow you to sprint really hard for eight to 10 seconds, they replenish, replenish aerobically. On top of all that, oxygen is relied on at all times during muscle contraction. It's actually been demonstrated within milliseconds, regardless of the dominant energy system, oxygen is in play. So it's crucially vital. Doesn't matter which energy system we're talking about. It's always, it's always part and parcel. Okay. So Richard, you referred specifically to 
uh, as, you, as your strengths, high fractional utilization, big word, and scrolling just caught up, <laughs> big word. The other one is uh, extended sweet spot durations. We're going to touch on both those. And uh, we're actually going to focus really highly on fractional utilization because even though it is a kind of a $10 word, it's also something that helps us understand aerobic efficiency, which is a pretty difficult topic and it gets thrown around almost as much as VO2 max does. And it's a very different thing. So let's talk about that. Fractional utilization is basically the percentage of your VO2 max utilized for a particular power output or a running velocity or a swim pace or a rowing pace or a cross country skiing, skiing pace. It's, it's all, all endurance sports can be looked at in terms of fractional utilization. So for us as cyclists, fractional utilization is effectively the oxygen cost of power. And if, I mean, we, we could probably simplify it way down to how many milliliters of oxygen does it take me to make a watt? So for example, what percentage of your aerobic capacity or what percentage of your VO2 max are you using when you're riding at 100 watts or at 200 watts or at 300 watts? You know, maybe you fall at 70% and then 80% and then 90% respectively. Now, without changing your VO2 max, so let's hold that constant. Let's say it never changes. You push it to a point that it's going to reside forever. Endurance training can improve your aerobic efficiency. Basically, you're reducing that oxygen cost. So the number of milliliters for every of oxygen for every watt have gone down a little bit. You're a little more efficient. So for that, you know, the example that I brought up earlier was a, an athlete with a 50 milliliter VO2 max. That athlete can stay at 50, improve their efficiency, and improve one of the three major components of endurance performance. So now instead, at 100 watts, 65% of VO2 max instead of 70. At 200 watts, it's 75. At 300 watts, it's 85 is that now the percentage of their fractional utilization of their VO2 max. So they've become a bit more efficient. There's a lower O2 cost associated with each of those power outputs. Hmm. And then of course, having said the three major components, I know you're gonna wonder what are the other two major components of endurance performance capacity and you're all very familiar with them if you've listened to us for any amount of time, FTP and VO2 max. Problem is when you know your FTP and maybe you know your F VO2 max or you've estimated it in some way and now you're kicking around the idea of aerobic efficiency, the tendency is try to trying to manage all three of these things. And how they relate can easily overcomplicate the basic pursuit of performance improvement. You know, we can start dwelling on the trees and not understand or not even recognize the forest. So add to that, that to get a handle on all these things and to track all these things, you got to spend time in the lab and probably lots of it, or you at least have to purchase expensive equipment and understand how to analyze the information you get from that equipment. And the fact of the matter is that most athletes need little more than just structured training that yields much more easily measured results. What do we typically come back to, but FTP I mean, build that engine. If FTP is going up, you you can't be doing things too poorly. I mean, you're, you're getting it pretty right. Re repeatability. Nate just mentioned this, you know, depending on the type of athlete you are, how frequently can you repeat the, the, effort levels and the durations that matter improved endurance or which is really just the ability to do longer intervals and it doesn't matter if they're blocks of endurance work at 65 percent or if you're talking about long to longer to really long sweet spot efforts or even one minute efforts at 120 percent up to two minutes up to three minutes up to what jonathan just did not at 120 but five minutes these are all forms of improvement that don't necessitate knowing everything about what your body's doing to get you there. Hmm. Um, on top of it, the, the, you can see improvements in lower oxygen costs, and you can get this just from looking at heart rate. If a certain power required this many BPM, and now that same power requires less BPM, your heart's not working as hard. Something improved. So this brings us to how do we improve our aerobic capacity? So the, the crux of Richard's question. So how do we, how do we manage or increase our, our VO2 max? And there's really two distinct approaches. It's the low intensity versus the high intensity. And, and both of them share a common goal, which is we're trying to achieve fatigue or overload. And with duration or you know, what's commonly referred to as long, slow distance or LSD, um, more scientifically, it's referred to as high volume, low intensity training, because if it's low intensity, it has to be high volume by its very nature. It's not going to yield improvement. The other end is intensity, which is high intensity interval training. So hit, and that's, that has to be low volume. So, I mean, it's just, just how it works. You can't do high volume, high intensity training, not for very long anyway. So you could look at this another way, put it really simply. It's time versus time at intensity. And they have, like I said, the same goal. We're trying to disrupt homeostasis. We're trying to put the body somewhere that it's, that it's not accustomed to being. And the outcomes, while similar, are also pretty different. 
um, they both increase. So, so let's look at the shared outcomes first. They both increase your aerobic capabilities. We've talked about these many times. You know, sometimes your VO2 max can change. It's not a fixed number. It's not something that can't be changed. We just showed that it can decline fast. It can also build fast. You can change your weight and that will change its relative value. Uh, fat utilization will probably change over the course of either one of these approaches. Enzymatic you know, aerobic enzymes, the content will likely change. Your muscular vas vascularization, you know, both the pliability of the big vessels and the proliferation of the smaller vessels in the muscle will probably change. And uh, on the lines of proliferation, the mitochondrial content. So both the size, the density, actually the size and the, and the, and the quantity, which I think is typically referred to as density, will change as well. How they differ though, is that when you do high volume, low intensity training, you're typically, you're, you're only targeting the slow twitch fibers. So you bolster the aerobic capacity of, or the aerobic capabilities, I should say, of those fibers, you run them down, you fatigue them as best you can, but all the endurance adaptations that come with this are basically limited to these fibers. You're not really touching the other fibers. So why, you know, what's their, what's their motivation to change? What's their stimulus? You might, over the course of fatiguing them, push yourself to a point where you're recruiting the medium twitch fibers and therefore they're going to gain some of the aerobic adaptations that your the, your fatigued slow twitch fibers can no longer the, the burden they can't shoulder um <clears throat> when it comes to the high intensity interval training this affects aerobic characteristics in the other fibers so the medium twitch fibers and the fast twitch fibers and that's i, I think what a lot of people don't understand is the entire fiber spectrum has anaerobic cap uh, capacities and aerobic capacities so so there's a little bit of everything it's just what are they more of that's what you know pushes them into different classifications so while the high intensity work is likely to do very little for the slow twitch fibers, it's just going to bypass them. I mean, it'll use them, but it's not going to use them to a point where it fatigues them to a point where they're forced to adapt. But the, like I said, the, the high intensity training trains aerobic adaptations into the other fibers than those predominantly aerobic slow twitch. Both the high volume, low intensity training and the high and uh, low volume, high intensity training are, are effective. They both have their place, but time is usually the limiter. And when it comes to low intensity training, it has to be long duration to achieve overload. And yeah, that's a relative term. Some people, a two hour ride is a long ride. For others, it's gotta be a five hour ride and it's gotta be several times a week. Mm -hmm. I mean, professional riders, world level riders, it's not uncommon to see them do a 30 hour week. Mm -hmm. But, and in a perfect world, we could do that too. We'd be able to blend them both routinely. A Little bit of the high end, a lot of the low end, a fair amount of, in, of the in between. But in reality, time restricts us, so we have to prioritize intensity over duration. That's, that's just the way it is. And at Trainer Road, it's no secret we're big on intervals, and that's basically why. Not only are they effective, but they're hu hugely time efficient. Mm -hmm. not, not only that, in terms of the effectiveness, they are the, the best way to accumulate time at highly productive intensities. So if, for example, you think of doing uh, work at 120% of FTP, you could go and do a single effort at six minutes and probably bury yourself. I mean, if you could even complete it, you would emerge from that being done. The idea of doing it again, it wouldn't matter how much recovery you put in between those six minute efforts, you're not doing it again. It's not gonna have a very high level of quality if you can. Opposite that, or not even opposite, superior to that is what if you did 18 one minute repeats and just separated them by a minute or maybe 30 seconds of rest and each of those minute repeats while not very uncomfortable not very comfortable can be performed again <clears throat> excuse me again 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 and again to the point where you rack up 18 minutes at that same power output so on the one hand six minutes and you're dead on the other hand 18 minutes three times the, the potential value of that workout and you could probably do two more if you had to so and, and, and it, admittedly, it's not continuous. So some of the adaptations do shift a bit. You know, it may become a little more about the heart, a little more about the muscle, depending on your approach, but you don't need to get hung up in that. That stuff's managed for you if you're following a training plan. So while the accumulation of time and intensity is, is totally incomparable, you also have to look beyond it and consider what happens with the performance. You know, what sort of adaptation, performance adaptation do you see if you work out for six minutes and then fall flat on the floor versus 18 minutes and then can come back a day or two later and do it again, or at least do something productive. And then you know, maybe you ask, you know, what if I have to be able to do long intervals at 120%? Well, follow a training plan because each of these plans is going to baby step you up to those more brutal demands. It's mm -hmm. all relative at that point, as, as you work through the, the base build cycle, you're going to get to a point where you specialize and we focus on those very things. So don't worry, it'll be handled at some point.
I just want to jump in and say to the to the time efficiency component of it, it's huge. And as somebody who in my career I have done I've done those 30 hour weeks, even then I'm trying to be mindful of minimizing my time coasting, making sure I'm staying on the pedals for the whole time because mm -hmm. I want to make sure that I'm making use of the time that I'm on the bike. And I think to your point, when you have a limited amount of time, you really want to make every minute count. And this is a really great way to do that. And one thing to consider with this too, is every rider has a limited amount of time. Mm -hmm. the, the most, <laughs> the most time liberated, and I'm doing air quotes, professional down to the most time crunched average person, you're still limited by time because in the end, your body and you're limited by what your body can do. Like, so <clears throat> I think there is a bit of a fallacy in our mind that we pose where we say that, well, other athletes are simply not limited. However I am, but really it does us no favors to look at it in that regard. Instead it's to look at how do I get the most bang for my buck? And even if a rider has more time, that does not mean that they are going to be getting more benefit from their training. If you are more, uh, if you're following a plan closer to its intended structure, if you're executing your workouts well and able to, you know, you're recovering efficiently so that you're able to do them and, and hit your marks continually, you're likely going to see more of a benefit, certainly more of a benefit than in concerning yourself with how others train, <laughs> you know, but, uh, it's a, yeah, consistency in hitting your marks. I'd say, um, actually there, people are limited by time and then you get limited by recovery. So there's like, oh, there's a you go to a certain point and then it's like usually lifestyle, but then there is just a genetic ability too. And that's usually what pros hit. And I bet you there's pros who would do 50 hours a week if they could recover and make it faster. Mm -hmm. They could yeah. probably even do 80, right? There's probably people who have the mindset that could do 80 if they could recover and it would make them faster. Uh, but there's no one that I know that can do that. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. definitely limited by time and not recovery. And I think most probably everyone listening to this, but Amber, were you living it by time or recovery? You think back in your pro days? Both. I mean, certain times of year, you know, we're traveling, we're racing. So there actually comes a point in the season where you can't really train much anymore. And you're relying hundred percent on the racing in order to maintain or increase if you can some level of fitness. Um, so the travel was a big thing. And then even in the off season, you're limited because I mean, you still have to, you still have to sleep. You still have to make meals for yourself. You're managing equipment. You're laying out logistics for the season. You're um, there's a lot of work that goes on the behind the scenes for sponsors as an example. So there's a lot of responsibilities and commitments off the bike in addition to riding. And then when you're only looking at training, there's still there's mobility, there's strength work, there's stretching, there's meditation, there's all of these other aspects and components of training where you run up against a limit because there's only 24 hours in the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So in one way or another, all our resources are limited, you know, whether it's time, yeah. whether it's our physical resources, whether it's all the other things that pull us a hundred different directions, just, we all face, we all face limits. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Richard, your second claim strength was holding sweet spot for extended periods of time. And first off, I want to say that's a, a highly valuable form of endurance when it comes to bike racing. I can't understate that enough. It's uh, referred to by a number of names. See the strength endurance. We commonly refer to it as muscle endurance or muscular endurance. Um, it's also more simply referred to as stamina. And stay tuned because we actually have a question that addresses stamina coming up. So I'm just going to postpone any more uh, <laughs> words of wisdom until then. Um, I do want to offer a word of caution, however, and that's if, if you're going to shift your focus to training a performance limiter, and you talked about a weakness, and we've differentiated between weaknesses and limiters in the past. Weakness, you're just not good at it. A limiter, it actually limits your performance. So do, do be clear on, on which it is you're faced with here, because if it's just something you're not good at, but you never employ it in a race, and you don't really need to be good at it, it's not really a limiter. But if it is a limiter and you do decide to target it, don't neglect this known strength. You're, you're, you're good at, at your sweet spot work. These are highly employable. This is a high, highly employable energy system. It's a, kind of an overlap of energy systems, but being able to dole out long efforts at sweet spot is hugely valuable in a racing scenario, especially in shorter races, which you know, I'm assuming, well, you're on a low volume plan. So that tells me you don't have a heck of a lot of time. This is a huge, uh, I do a lot of sweet spot and um, I'm doing the high volume plan right now. This is a, such a huge thing that's helped me win races is road and crit is coming. Okay. So road race, end of a four hour road race, there's usually a, it's always like, it kicks up so hard at the end and it gets really hard. And although maybe my max capacity is any higher, mine has dropped less relative to everybody else. I'm looking around and people that usually beat me and outclimb me 
are cooked mm -hmm. because they all these longer kind of sustained climbs that we did that were at like 90 percent uh it hurt them more than it hurt me because i'm like that's not a big deal i can do like eight of those in a race mm -hmm. or maybe they could do four and at the end their max capacity is down and if a crit too, um, the videos we have on YouTube of me, a lot of times I'm doing a whole bunch of like sustained, like one minute power at the end rather than a sprint because my sprint's not very good. And that's because the whole rest of the race, it didn't like my maximum one minute effort isn't hurt as much as other people. And you get that gap. So it's, it's uh, especially then for gravel racing, you're pretty much zone two or sweet spot, like the whole race. Mm -hmm. And I think Cape Epic, we're mostly going to be zone mm -hmm. two or sweet spot day after day, five hours, six, seven hours a day, 11 for some teams. Have fun. Uh, and then <laughs> that will just go on and on and on. And uh, having this kind of stamina is, is huge to be able to operate at a high percentage of, of threshold and not have your legs get cooked. Yeah, one, one, one note on this, and uh, Chad, you and I have talked about this before, and it's a common thing that people uh, encourage others to do, but look back at your race files and successful races where you where you did well and everything else. And in most cases in our minds, we highlight the hard parts, but really like the, the, the glue that held everything together in that race, it's all the in-betweens. And in many cases in race scenarios, the in-between the the decisive in-between is sitting around sweet spot. It's, it's not that, you know, it's many times we get onto the climb. We get this question so much. I always get dropped on the climbs. I must be a bad climber, but it's, it's probably less that they're a bad climber. It's more the things that led up to that. And the things that lead up to decisive moments in races uh, are many times it's spent in that sweet spot zone. Uh, it's, it's, it's not comfortable. It's hard. But like Nate said, if you can increase that and through specific training and through following a structure plan that's doing it, man, it really makes things easy. So, uh, man, a claim strength for you to have that right there. Way to go. That's a, that's a really mm -hmm. desirable thing to have as an athlete. Chad yeah, too, and... this, this is one of your weaknesses, right? Is it's the same sweet spot. You know, this going into Cape Epic. Yeah, no, this is, this was actually one of my strengths when I raced well. But it's oh, one really? of my weaknesses now because I don't address it, and it is actually a limiter. So yeah, yeah. which is why you've been yep. doing so much sweet spot work lately. You're, it's like you know what you're doing, well, I, Chad. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll get back on it too. I did a block of it, and then I'm, I'm, I'm actually testing a bunch of things and figuring some stuff out. Really interesting stuff that I will share over time. But I'll, I'll get back to it because yes, it is, and I agree with Nate. I think that's what Cape Epic is going to be. We're going to be riding very aerobically, and then we're going to be pushing at sweet spot. I mean, mm -hmm. there might be occasional moments where we have to power up something, but by and large, we're going to be in one of those two places. Besides Amber, you, you need to practice your sprint. <laughs> <laughs> every race, that, every race start with the sprint. All that <laughs> I feel like Chad's going to be in like, well, let me, let me rephrase that. Honey is going to be in extra sweet spot. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that was, oh, okay. Amber's not even a dad. That was impressive. <laughs> His teammate's got legs. Man. All right. Oh, man. Okay, Sorry, so Chad. actually what, what Jonathan and Nate just talked about, tease up this, my, my closing point really well. It's, it's more of a rhetorical question. I'm curious how you, Richard, or really anybody pinpoints these strengths uh, without lab time anyway. I, I understand certain things seem to point to certain things, but when we make these assumptions, we run the risk of making incorrect assumptions, especially regarding our weaknesses and weaknesses and limiters. And that differentiation that I just pointed out between weaknesses and limiters is an important one. But when you get it wrong, you're potentially risking an entire training plan that pursues less than optimal, a less than optimal approach. So you're really chasing the wrong improvements all due to something I'll, I'll call performance misdiagnosis. You think this is the issue. So this is the issue you address when it was never really the issue. So do be clear on what is exactly the issue. And for example, say you're the sort of rider who falls off on short two minute climbs. And your assumption then is that your VO2 max is limiting your performance. I feel like it's something along these lines that has led you here. When in fact, maybe it's riding at your sweet spot intensity for 30 minutes before you get to that hill. Maybe it's because you poorly paced the start of the hill and blew yourself up halfway up the hill. Maybe it's because you're 20 pounds heavier than all the other riders who are tailing you off. So VO2 max might not actually be the limiter in all those cases. Just I have found, I just, ahead. sorry, I just want to add positioning to that too, because yeah, if you totally. go into a hill in the wrong position, it, 
No, it's you're all, right. All and let me, th this is, that's, that's one of the points I was going to make. I, I, yeah. I found that the easiest way to pinpoint your weaknesses or your limiters is, is by analyzing your performance and not yeah. getting too hung up on the physiology. Physiology is important, but it's not everything. So in the case above, what if instead of riding toward the front of the field or pushing 90% of your power, your, your FTP, you try hiding in the bunch before you get to that two minute climb. What if you start at the front of the field in the climb and sink to the back of the field by the end of the climb? What if you try pacing the early half of that climb a bit more conservatively, even if most of the pack's moving away from you. And I promise you, most of them will be coming back to you real soon. Hmm. So it, again, it might not be, you might be thinking, I need to fix my VO2 max, my aerobic capacity. I need to start doing a bunch of 120% efforts. All these things may not be exactly what, what you need to do. Um, I, I, so let me close this out with just a couple bits of advice for you specifically, Richard. First off, I think you've outgrown low volume. Um, you, you're, pushing a almost a 300 watt threshold at 4.1 watts per kilogram. And if you're on low volume, you're doing it with three and a half hours of work a week. I don't know that you're going to be able to push that a heck of a lot higher doing less than four hours a week work, but an intensive block, as you suggest, might be overdoing it. Recognize the value in subtle increases because they can actually carry really good effect. And in the case, you could even stick with the low volume plan, make your Tuesday and Thursday workouts, 75 minute workouts instead of 60 minute workouts, or maybe just one of them. Maybe your Saturday 90 minute workout becomes a two hour workout, or you just tack on a little bit of endurance at the end of it, maybe another half hour or to an hour, or maybe you add a long Sunday ride and maybe you don't even get it every week. Maybe you do it every other Sunday. These changes can all carry impact, especially it seems like you're very trainable based on the, the, those statistics. So I wouldn't get too carried away and look to be too radical with any of your changes. Um, and then finally, if time allows it, maybe it's time to move to a mid volume plan. I want to, I have a question for Amber. Amber, mm -hmm. you are relatively way better than me, but in your races, you have the same, you're a bigger rider, right? Yeah. Compared to your competition. Do you ever have it on a climb where it was a shorter climb and you intentionally let people gap because there was a, another group of bigger riders with you and you knew you're just going to catch that smaller riders like five oh, minutes yeah. later. Oh yeah. I mean, certainly you, you evaluate the course. And if you know that this, this particular climb, isn't necessarily going to be a selection point because you know, the group's going to come back to later, come back together later. There's no point in killing yourself at that point. Um, some climbs though are selectors and then you have to really be willing to turn the screws at those points. But I was actually just reminded of, uh, to your point, a, a story pretty early on in my career, I was doing a big climbing stage race and I ended up in a breakaway on one of the days and one of the riders hassled me about it and said, why would you ever go on the breakaway with rider when you know that you're 30 pounds heavier than everybody else in the breakaway? And I was so angry about that. And there was a huge, it was like the queen stage the next day, this big monster climb that everybody was scared of. And because I'm strong, I have good power. I had good positioning and I raced really well. I ended up right next to this girl on the climb, oh. <laughs> the whole climb in my head. I just had this mantra going. I just kept looking over at her and looking over at her and being like 30 pounds, huh? 30 pounds. How's it going? How's that? How's that 30 pounds going? <laughs> Didn't say it out loud, but it was so motivating. Oh man. I so bet. don't, oh, don't underestimate the, the power of mindset and, and motivation and positioning and all of the other skill sets that surround your physiology. Cause it all comes together, um, to, to contribute to your actual performance. Another thing on climbs on the opposite side. So here's like the two scenarios that I see and both for smaller, better power to weight and bigger people, the smaller people, they will on the short climbs, this happens at a race in bulk all the time. They kick it so hard trying to hurt the bigger people on purpose mm -hmm. and the bigger people, if it's, if it's a not decisive climb and you try to go, you get hurt. Right. But as a bigger person, and you know, it's not deci de decisive, you can go slower. And what happens in, in Reno, there's a, there's two of them where, uh, you can go really hard with the really fast people and bring yourself out, or you literally catch them on the downhill, especially if you have a few big people. Cause you, this thing happens where you're descending, you get each other's slipstream and one person goes by and then that's the new speed and the next person goes by and that's the new speed and you kind of get this like yo-yo thing and every single time then it goes to a little bit of flat you catch him like three minutes later and pete is amazing he wins a hilly pete does this every time at poker right he lets the really uh light people go and doesn't blow himself up paces correctly and then catches them later so mm -hmm. another 
and then you know what he does on the way to catch them is sweet spot which is pretty crazy <laughs> yeah that that race course in its its uh layout has taught me more strategically and tactically than any other race course i've done and that's probably because of the repetition of it we do it so frequently but man there are so many ways to skin that same cat to figure out how to make that climb not as uh damaging as it could be for a bigger rider Mm -hmm. yep. That's what makes cycling so fun is yeah. you can play to your strengths and there's all kinds of different ways that you can employ tactics and try to figure out ways of, of improving the outcome for yourself. That's and you why can also in that, that climb, you can make the, I think because Pete has come back so many times and bigger riders come back it actually, then the smaller riders miss, they do too much on that climb. Cause they're like, I need an extra 10 seconds on this climb mm -hmm. or 20 seconds and they go all out and then they burn themselves <laughs> out. It's actually worse. So you're they talking the, about, with... you're talking about me. Cause I'm one of the climbers that ends up <laughs> yeah. going on that, but here's what I do. I front load the whole thing. And I tell Pete, every time I'm with him, Pete, you're such a good climber. Pete, don't listen to this, by the way. Um, uh, <laughs> I, say, right now. I say, you're such a good climber. You're <laughs> awesome. You're doing great. You're so good. I bet you could stick with everybody on the wall now. And if you catch us when you, when you are sandbagging that climb, imagine when you're actually with us, you'll just tear us apart, but it never works because Pete's an intelligent person and he knows <laughs> what's going on and he does, makes good decisions. So, but like, that's just the thing, right? You're trying to make, and that's bike racing kind of in its essence, in one respect, you're hoping that other people make the foolish decisions while you make the right decisions. And mm -hmm. there are tons of ways that you can try to influence that, um, that are, that are totally fair and honest. Right. And they're not ways that are, that are like, I'm talking about deceiving somebody into telling them, you know, there, there's something they're not or anything else. It's the subtle cues and the way the race unfolds and everything else. Our ambitions can get the most of us. And in times when we think that we can maybe be this athlete that we probably aren't, those are the times when we get in trouble. Right. And, and so it's all about setting the scene so that somebody might make that foolish decision while you make the right decisions. So it's it, like really comes it is, it it's is, not, it's not a unethical thing. It's just like, Ooh, you should take this rook. And then you're <laughs> yeah. like, ah, check me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> yeah, exactly. If you like this video, you should subscribe to our channel. Maybe even give this video a like with a thumbs up and a comment down below. If you want to see race analysis videos, you can click on it right over here. And if you want to get your coaching questions answered, you can click on it right over here. And if you want to become a faster cyclist, which you should, you should go over to trainerroad.com. It'll make you faster. We promise. We guarantee it, right, Nate? Guaranteed. <laughs> or your money back. Yes, it's true, actually. We, we really will do that. Yeah.